Welcome to I'm Spiritual Dammit. I'm your host, Jennifer Weigel, and joining me on the phone, William Meter, who is an author, an esoteric philosopher, a teacher, astrologer. Any other hats I'm missing, William? <laughs> Oh, I think that's good enough. That's yeah. good. All right. Fantastic. So talk to me about your journey. This started for you at a very young age. You were questing. You kind of had this feeling that there was more out there, and it and it kind of sent you on this deep dive of exploration. Explain to the listeners how that happened for you. Well, when I was in my late teens, I um, actually I, 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 I went to a funeral, and I got real curious about the question of life and death and that sort of thing, and Started after that was moved to start reading about some metaphysical things for the first time and ran into the subject of meditation and was so intrigued by that that I decided to, uh, as a 16-year-old, see if I could learn to meditate. And I found a transcendental meditation and I began became a fairly avid um, regular meditator for a number of years back then. And as and as I got into my early 20s and mid 20s, I was by then not only meditating but really reading a lot about you know, different spiritual approaches, different spiritual perspectives. And at one point, I kind of came across a whole body of spiritual understanding of things called the theosophy or the esoteric philosophy. And I, it, it, it was like coming home. Mm. I recognized it so profoundly that it really became the centerpiece of my view of life. But also, uh, without realizing it, I didn't at that time know that in, in, in many years to come, it would be the focus of my work life as well. So I now teach this philosophy around the world. I teach in um, nine countries. And so um, it's become really the focal point of my reason for being in a way. That's amazing. And it's really incredible that at 16, you were able to embrace the transcendental meditation philosophies, which I know many adults that couldn't sit through and be patient and quiet enough to let their bodies completely absorb that process, which I know is has been a challenge for me. I've been trying to meditate since my 20s. I'm in my 40s, and I, and I am now dedicating a half hour a day to meditation. And I've got these audio CDs from the Monroe Institute, which I'm sure you're familiar with. Um, um, yeah. yeah, and and they're you know probably decades old, these meditations, but they're so effective in the way that they can trying to connect both sides of the brain and the different tones. And I mean, this is... This is science. For those who think that meditation is a woo-woo word, it is very proven to be effective in stress reduction and in awareness, intelligence, all of these things. What do you think we're missing here as a country when it comes to embracing this idea of the effectiveness of meditation? Well, I think that the key to understanding the value of meditation is that it's a process by which you draw deep inside yourself to discover that there's a dimension of your identity, you might say, that is beyond your thoughts, beyond your feelings, beyond your physical sensations. Mm -hmm. And in that gradual realization through meditation, you become more and more aware of the fact that, that you have a, a part of you that is beyond your personality, beyond your lower self. And that really starts to make you more confident in the reality that that there's something that transcends your your temporal existence. In a, in a certain sense, meditation in the long run confirms to you that you have an existence beyond death. Mm -hmm. um, but it, you're quite right. I mean, meditation is a system that is the best for tra uh, stress management, as you say. Mm -hmm. Meditation is also wonderful for uh, just heightening your capacity to, to uh, learn, Mm -hmm. But it's also, in a way, to find your center, to really discover who you truly are. It awakens you to the soul itself, and that's what it impassions me. My whole work today is about that question of what is the soul, and how do we recognize it um, deep within us, and how do we more effectively find ways of expressing it in the fabric of our day-to-day -day lives. Mm -hmm. and meditation is, is a means to facilitate that process. You know, I'm in this constant balance, William, between trying to go micro because every moment matters, right, with every thought and every exchange, um, but then also to go macro and realize that our hyper small world is a part of a very big tapestry. You know, for example, what's going on globally right now and, and in our country, and I know this is going to be something 
that you're addressing at Equilibrium here in Chicago on the 17th of April from 6 to 8 p.m. For anybody listening, go to equilibrium-e3.com. That's equilibrium-e, the number three, dot com, where William will be coming to town to teach. But this is about how you're going to explain that we aren't currently in a crisis, but it's actually a new beginning. There's this soul of humanity happening. Explain what you mean by that. Well, I, I would have to say it's a little different. It's a crisis, but actually crisis is the prelude to all major expansions of consciousness. Got it. Got it. And, and so it is a crisis, but it is and sometimes in the ancient philosophies, they call it the period of the burning ground. Mm -hmm. And it's a tremendously testing period. And that's what's happening in the world today. And one of the things to keep in mind um, just to give a context to that, is that when we talk about um, uh, the soul, what we first have to realize, and the human kingdom, let us say, we have to realize that soul is much bigger than simply your individual soul. In fact, um, a, a country, a country is an entity. A country is a living being, and it has a soul, and it has a personality. And it has a tendency to, at times, the, the soul of the personality tries to influence the personality of the country, and that personality tendency will rise up in defiance, just like it is with you and I individually. There are times when you really want to sense and live that higher part of yourself, and there are times when that lower part of you resists and, and puts up a battle. Mm -hmm. That same principle applies on a collective level uh, as well. So for that's what's the, happening today. That's what's happening today. I've interviewed a lot of great thought leaders such as yourself who feel that this current administration actually had to happen to cause the awakening and the community that is happening uh, that would not have otherwise taken place because everybody was sort of sedentary and, and comfortable in their zone and didn't really want to think about the neighbors that had completely opposite beliefs. They just wanted to stay in their carpool lane, you know. And so I wonder <laughs> if you agree with that philosophy. Uh, in part, I do. In part, I do. Um, I think that um, uh, they, there's different. We we could have made a, uh, decisions that would make this transition less painful, mm. but humanity, or in particularly America, made a decision. They chose a more painful route than it had to be. But in truth, you're quite right. In the broader sense, um, this is revealing uh, many of the shadowy issues of our collective consciousness. And therefore, through that realization, we recognize that something has to be done about it. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the kind of, one of the fundamental notions here is that um, that there's there's reason to be optimistic from the point of view that um, always uh, the shadowy issues will rise up and seem overpowering initially, and then the sum total of goodness of humanity will eventually rise to the call and do the hard work of transforming that shadow. And that, that applies individually and collectively. Mm. You know, in all of the research that you have done over the years, William, I'm wondering how you feel about manifesting. I have a lot of different interviews I've done where people have different theories on this, from, oh, everybody deserves to have abundance, to you have no idea what the universe has in store for you, and maybe it's your turn to feel lack, so you can have compassion for those who also have lack. What is your belief system on our kind of journey in the abundant zone? Uh, well, I, I, I view the notion of abundance as being um, much, much wider than simply financial abundance. Well, yes, abundance, of course, like thought, connectivity. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so, um, but there are incarnations that are very much designed uh, to put us uh, individually into more challenging positions that might challenge our understanding of abundance mm -hmm. and lessons to be learned are derived through that. There are certain incarnations that are said to be deliberately staged as harmonic and others that have a note of dissonance. But having said that, some of the greatest growth comes through the process of dissonant qualities arising in one's life. Mm. And that applies not just to the question of abundance, but it has, a, has to do with relationships and many, many factors of life. Mm -hmm. How do you get to trust and surrender and, and a knowing that you are being guided? I'm sure meditation helps greatly, but what other methods do you have to start your day and to finish your day to help keep you on the path? Well, I tell you what, there's a tremendous amount of, 
of comfort in the knowledge that that um, inwardly we are all one, mm -hmm. and that that uh, in fact one of the important concepts in esotericism is to recognize that that's one of the ways that you know that you are aligning with and recognizing some of the impulses from the soul. The soul in each of us is the part of our consciousness that senses the underlying unitive field mm -hmm. and therefore senses the oneness, while the personality, the lower self, is is essentially separative in its consciousness. Mm -hmm. The soul is unitive in its consciousness. So anything that I can do in, in the day to begin my day with a sense of honoring and feeling gratitude for being a cell within a larger divine system of life mm -hmm. uh, is important because you and I are cells within a larger living entity. Mm -hmm. One of the things to keep in mind, Jennifer, is that this is like a core principle is that so often in Western cultures, we've been taught there's God and a creation, mm -hmm. God and creation. But esotericism says, no, that's not correct. It's not God and creation. It's God as creation. Mm -hmm. And God as creation is a whole different paradigm for understanding who we are and how we relate to the larger life. And in, the, in, a, in essence, when we think about the spiritual path and the search for, for divinity, in the biggest, deepest truth, you are the divinity you seek mm. because you are a cell within that one life that manifests manifest in and as creation. Mm -hmm. And that, that's how I start my day, always holding an attitude of, of gratitude in the knowledge that I'm a cell within a great divine singularity. That's awesome. You know, I recently met a woman who had a near-death experience, and she was technically dead for seven minutes. And so she came back, and she had this awareness, this complete knowing that we have to activate more of the the right brain and get out of our left brain. Would that be correct? Left brain is much more logical, and we need to touch it, to feel it, to understand it, to believe it, right? Do I have those correct, William? That's correct. Okay. But, but, yeah, that's, but that's correct, but I would I would add a nuance to that. Mm -hmm. it's, that the, it's that that's because uh, Western cultures have dominated in the left correct. and not as much on the right. But the truth is both are sacred mm -hmm. and both are needed and both have to be ultimately harmonized and synthesized as a function of the evolution of consciousness. Well, thank you for saying that because I, what ended up happening was I was sort of arguing with this woman because she was saying, well, I know I'm going to do such and such a project. And, you know, she said, I know I'm going to produce this project. And I said, okay, do you have this, this, and this, which are the tools needed to make this happen? And she said, nope, see, there you are going in your left brain. We don't need those things. And I said, well, that's like okay. saying you get in a car and you don't need wheels to make it go. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> they have exactly. to work together. <laughs> that's right. And and it's it's so true as, a, as part of humanity's evolution now. You see, you see, Jennifer, esotericism would say this, that we are moving from the the period of evolution that we would call mysticism mm -hmm. uh, into the period that we call practical mysticism. And so the whole effort now is to learn how to ground and be practical and mystical at the same time, and that requires the synthesis of both the right and the left hemispheres of the brain. I am so glad I brought this up because that is really important. I have a lot of friends who are not at all in contact with their left brain and so they're flapping all over the place in their right brain <laughs> and there's no yeah. groundedness to what they're bringing to the table which as you say has to have that balance right okay right. oh that's, that's really right. good that's important so that being said and trying to achieve that balance um you know when you find yourself coming up against any challenge how do you sort of get out of your own way what is your go-to to remember i mean oh yes you have human moments you are a spiritual you know, you're a human, you're having a spiritual being having a human experience. So how do you get out of your own way if you do ever get in your own way? <laughs> of course, yes, certainly I get in my own way at times. Mm -hmm. The only way you can, to, to anybody can claim that they never get in their own way, they'd be fully enlightened and a master. Right. <laughs> so yes. having said that, one of the things that I always try to remind myself of, particularly when I'm in a situation and I'm tr struggling to understand how to rightly react, mm -hmm. Is, is that I always have to remember that there's actually, I have to ask myself, which one of me is perceiving right now? Mm. 
because you see the soul and the personality are both operative in the fabric of our perceptions at any given moment. And part of the path is to learn the difference between the perceptual processes of the lower self versus those of the higher self. And, and you have to be bone honest with yourself as you kind of self-assess which one of me is perceiving, which one of me is acting and reacting at this moment. Mm-hmm. And um, that, cause, that requires a kind of pause and um, an introspective moment to, to look at that. Um, it's really important that when you're on the path, it really means that you have awoken to your own duality. You sense the higher part of you and, and the day-to-day consciousness. And the more you have a sensitivity to that, the better. I've always reminded of the, the words of Kyle Gibran in the, the book, The Prophet, you may remember. Oh, sure. He says something like this, and I'm going to paraphrase it, but he says, you come to the discovery that um, you discover the God within you and the pygmy in the mist. The pygmy <laughs> in the mist. That's I true. I love that phrase. Yeah. And, and, and it's in that discovery that you realize that you are a dual creature Mm -hmm. and that what happens is it's all about recognizing that both of those parts of you have the capacity to perceive and act and react and we just have to be sensitive to that and aware of that uh, as much as we can moment to moment when i was doing a meditation yesterday uh, i i had this visual of getting into sort of a water slide you know the flow of the water and the water slide goes very fast you can tell i have a young child because i'm talking about a water slide <laughs> but okay. the visual of the water kind of going down the the tube so to speak right and when you get in it then you go with that flow and it takes you quite quickly but if you just stand yeah. there and the flow is going down, you know, it's just going to come up against your calves and eventually it might take you over or you step out and you don't go down the slide. You know, you have a choice. Yeah. And right. so I was choosing to get into the slide and go with that flow and really let that flow take me. And I, and I, and I really felt sort of like a tingling, like this was a good thing for me to visualize doing because I think so many times we stand there in the slide while the water hits our calves and go, I don't know. We start to overanalyze. We think the pros and cons, and then that's getting too much into your left brain. So you can think to yourself, okay, am I wearing a swimsuit? There's your left brain. Yes, I am. Am I going to be okay? Well, I don't see any crocodiles at the end. I'm going in the slide. And then poof, <laughs> let the flow take you. So you do, but you don't get stuck in your analyzing of whether or not that's a good choice. Does that make sense? Right. There's a lot of truth to that. There's mm-hmm. a lot of truth that we can overanalyze things. And in a, in a sense, we, we end up in a kind of a uh, paralysis through analysis process, mm-hmm. and, uh, um, and uh, we have to rise above that. And yet, at the same time, it doesn't mean uh, uh, absolutely no analysis. You mm-hmm. have to at least know that it's water. You have to at least know that it's a slide. <laughs> right, right. You know? so, All right, here's yeah. another uh, totally different question, but what are you, your thoughts on dark energies? Are we kind of in this Star Wars where there's a dark versus light, and do you think there is a darkness that is trying to stop the light? Uh, the answer is yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> um, and and it, it, it's you, you asked such an interesting question. Uh, I think that there's a um, if we, if we look at the subject of evil, let's use that word evil. In the esoteric philosophy, there's a couple definitions of evil, mm-hmm. and one of them is more natural evil, and the other is unnatural. And um, the natural evil is what you often see in in the human experience, but occasionally you get more unnatural evil than the unnatural evil that's actually participating in what's going on in the world today. But let me just dis- to tr- tell you about natural evil, okay? Mm-hmm. I'm going to give you a, a definition of, of a way of understanding evil in the natural sense. Evil is the good that has outlived its usefulness. Okay. In other words, Humanity evolved through its relationship to ideas. We have new ideas. They're, they actually come through the soul. We use them. They uplift us. They transform the way we live in all our social institutions. But every idea that a human being has, eventually, it outlives its usefulness. It's given us all it can. Mm-hmm. And what happens is that in the process, we need to uh, free ourselves from it to adopt the next, next paradigm. Mm-hmm. But what happens is the lower self, the lower self habitualizes its relationship to the old idea. And so we be slowly become imprisoned by an old idea. 
And and I often say to my new students, I often say, always remember, uh, that which is your temple today will become your prison tomorrow. Mm. The views that you hold, if they if they help you grow and expand, great. But eventually, eventually, it will do all it can, and then you are likely to get imprisoned by it unless you're willing to break free. So so many of the problems that humanity faces are often based upon. Uh, the overattachment to old ideas, mm-hmm. and, and 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 much of the strong tendency today toward going back to the uh, to conservative perspectives of the past are actually just a, a knee jerk reaction out of fear, and it's a sense of going back to the old mm-hmm. rather than recognizing that we have to forge new paradigms to help us move forward. So that's natural. That. That's built into the way humanity relates and evolves through consciousness and ideations. Yeah. Then there's another kind of evil that, um, um, well, you know, kind of, he's using the Star Wars idea as a yeah. kind of a useful idea. Uh, there is there's a, a more sinister kind of uh, force uh, that works against humanity too. It represents. Sometimes in the old literature they call it the Black Lodge, mm-hmm. but it represents the uh, the sum total of the separative consciousness within the collective consciousness of humanity, mm-hmm. and that energy has a vested interest, particularly now, at preventing humanity from moving forward toward oneness. Because you see, Jennifer, esotericism would say that right now humanity, the big thing that's trying to happen is that we're trying to understand our oneness and trying to understand how to be one, because if we don't figure that out, we're in big trouble in the future, that's for sure. And and yet, um, uh, yet there are a lot of forces that are trying to push us away from that. Mm-hmm. Um, it is called the power... The, the, this, this darker force is governed by what is called what we call the heresy of separateness. Mm. The heresy of separateness. And uh, in fact, it has been said that the that um, evil arises through the perception of separateness. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And um, because humanity is at a great transitional point, and we think that in this century it's possible that humanity may take what we call the first initiation, which really means not only awakening to our oneness, but really starting to fully live as a as a global community, and, and we're, 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 in the, we're in the transition, burning ground period, trying to get there, mm-hmm. and there's a lot of oppositional forces that are trying to promote the opposite, a separative perspective. So you see it certainly in our politics today with talking about walls and the rise in racism and sexism and, and um, the, the, the amount of separative consciousness that is asserting itself right now is is deliberately in an opposition to what the larger trend is, mm. and that is that we are, we must evolve to recognize that we're all one. And nationalism mm. and patriotism are now great obstacles to where humanity is going. Mm. We need to be thinking about the one humanity, not any particular preoccupation with any one nation. Right. And, and a, a, a nation is sacred and there's nothing. It's all about finding unity by honoring diversity. That's right. the key. Right. One must realize through diversity. Exactly. And anything opposite of that is just a fear of those that are not like you. You know, that's right. Those that you that's cannot right. relate to. So how do you how does one go about protecting themselves from the now, you know the the one the first one of the like you mentioned something that's run its course that 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 can be explained and I think to the so the intelligent listener that's absorbing this right now they can go oh yeah I see when I've done that or it's like the teacher that needs to retire or the the text that you need to put down or you know a lot of things I notice religious ways this is happening as well but for the other dark side the dark force the Darth Vader if you will how does one protect themselves. Oh, okay. Well, um, the, the first thing I would say is that um, it, you know there, you can use meditation processes to create uh, the the image of kind of having an energetic shield mm-hmm. around you, right. which is, can be very useful. Uh, and many people do that, including myself at times. Um, but I think that I think that you are the more you recognize the shadow in you, the more you recognize how to 
recognize it out there in the world and how to defend against it. Mm. One of the great lessons that humanity has to come to realize is that, well, I'll tell you a real quick story. I really, I, I, one, I, was, I did a talk many years ago in Phoenix, Arizona, and there was a woman who interrupted my talk. She jumped up in this, and it was a big audience of about 100 people, and this woman t- jumped up and she said, I just want to know, do you believe in the Antichrist? And the amazing thing about it was I wasn't even talking about that. <laughs> but she had an agenda, it, obviously. <laughs> she, and 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 um, and I paused for a minute and and I said to her, I said, I said, well, I actually do. Mm-hmm. And then after that, I said, I can even tell you who it is. <laughs> I tell you, everybody in the audience, everybody in the audience got really quiet at that right. point. Right. And I said, if you want to know who the Antichrist is, all you have to do is look in the mirror. Mm. And then I said, if you want to know who the Christ is, all you have to do is look in the mirror. And you don't even have to move, because you and I are a place where two forces interface within consciousness. Mm-hmm. I said, then, because what is Christ anyway? Christ is the principle of unity and love and wisdom. And what is Antichrist? It's any state of consciousness that is antithetical to it. Mm-hmm. So you don't have to necessarily go out and look for the bad guy. Mm-hmm. It's about recognizing your own shadow. We're all dual. Right. And, that, and that's true in society, and that's true with humanity as a whole. And I think the more we recognize our own duality and learn how to recognize and transform our lower self, the more we are, are innately shielding ourselves from being um, unduly influenced by the shadow of the larger society that's also trying to to move us backwards in time. Do you believe that we bring on negative things with our fears and thoughts, or are there just some things that bad things happen to people, or wrong place, wrong time kind of thing? There's a few different theories on this with different thought leaders, and I'd love to know where you stand on it. Well, uh, as so many things, I say it's not either or, but both. Mm-hmm. I think I think that uh, there, are, there are some aspects of, of, of negative things that are... Um, uh, that that happen unintended, right? And there are some some that are part of the destiny of the soul. You see, one of the things to keep in mind is the soul in us is is imperfect. It's trying to evolve toward perfection, mm-hmm. and that um, it, as every incarnation, it's becoming more able to express itself through the personality with less and less distortion. Right. But even with that truth. Um, the, that doesn't mean that the soul can predict all outcomes. Mm-hmm. It, it can predict more outcomes than the personality, but not all outcomes. And therefore, there are there is such a thing as an accident. So yeah. Um, and, and and everything is not caused by destiny. Mm-hmm. And that's also because you and I are dual. Part of your consciousness is more prone to accident, and part of it is completely regulated by. Um, a kind of karmic uh, intention. Mm-hmm. And, you know, so, I, I, there's so many people, too, that, that feel like, oh, my gosh, I put that out there with my worry loop. I mean, I do know some people that have a constant loop of, I'm going to get ripped off. And guess who always gets ripped off? <laughs> so they are projecting okay. that. But then there's also a part that they, they could undo that. But then, like you say, they could just accidentally get into a bike wreck or something like that is not because they were thinking, I'm going to get in a bike accident today. Yeah, yeah. Well, a good example. Let's let's look at uh, an example of um, Abraham Lincoln. Now, mm-hmm. Abraham Lincoln, we, we, we refer to him as a third degree initiative, very advanced person. Um, who who was called to serve through the Department of, um, of Government. Mm-hmm. Now, Abraham Lincoln, his most famous speech was the Gettysburg Address. Mm-hmm. Like that's, and yeah. he wrote that speech uh, while on a train to Gettysburg on napkins. And when he wrote that speech, uh, at least this is what I had read, that he, he apparently, um, after he completed the speech, he felt that he completely failed with that speech, and that he 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 was unworthy of even assuming that that was the right uh, idea to express, mm. and and yet it became his most famous influential speech uh, in history. Uh, some people would say it's the most famous speech of all time, mm-hmm. and and so here, if he would, you know, his mind had doubts all along, and yet it became the such a transformational thing. Now, if, if, it's, if it's true that everything is the product of your 
of your um, attitude, uh, that doubt would have caused him to fail with that speech and been more likely. And yet it was such a transformational thing for society. So you get what I'm trying to say there? Absolutely. You know, I, I completely get that. And so I have this theory, um, William, that basically the thing that fears us, that, that gives us the stomach ache the most is the thing we need to do the most. Because for some reason, it's making us anxious. And it, it, I, I this used to happen with, with public speaking or certain meetings. Because I feel like that was my, my higher self kind of going, this is going to be transformational for you. Anything that we don't want to face, if we just avoid it, it will show up in a different costume, a different cast member, I feel, so that yeah. we can master it, get past it, and then it no longer rules us and upsets us and fe- it makes us fearful. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, and I would agree with that wholeheartedly. Mm-hmm. Sure. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Now, I want to ask yeah. you quickly about the astrology side of things because I, I huh. had the pleasure of, of getting your insights um, on some of my birth chart based on exactly when I was born and, and where the planets are in my chart. And the stuff that you were telling me was so me that I just, it just boggles my mind how this can be so, but yet I know it's all mathematics and it's all, it, it's so much bigger than I can really wrap my head around. But what has your look into astrology done for you with your teaching and with your philosophies? Has it really just sort of been this sort of side thing that's grown or has it always been there for you on your path? Uh, well, first, I'm an esoteric astrologer, not a traditional astrologer. Correct. Yes, I'm sorry, esoteric, I didn't, esoteric, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, esoteric astrology has so much to do with rec- looking at a chart and trying to understand how does the soul want to pattern the nature of consciousness and how may the lower self get in the way. Mm-hmm. Um, and when I first began my spiritual journey back as a teenager, I knew nothing about astrology, nor was I particularly attracted to it. But when I entered into the the study of esotericism, there's a whole branch of esotericism called esoteric astrology. And initially, I was just reading it out of curiosity. But the more I started reading it and thinking about it in the context of my own spiritual journey, the the more I realized, wow, there's some real relevance to this. And so um, it, it has had increasingly over the years more and more influence in my life. And it has a lot to do with understanding the steps to transform the personality so that it becomes the rightful servant of the soul. Um, and, and so I, think, I just think, I feel it's one of, the, one of the most useful tools. You know, in, in the ancient philosophy, it is said that it has another name. It's called the science of relationship. But mm. You might think, well, what does that have to do with it? Well, it's the relationship between the macrocosm and the microcosm. You see, planets are living things, mm-hmm. and the universe is alive. And... and you are a part within that larger whole. And astrology is an attempt to understand the language of the larger as it's trying to inform the part within the larger, in this mm-hmm. case, a human being. Uh, so I just find it incredibly rich, and I'm glad that you found it valuable when we spoke. Oh, absolutely. And then today I was at the grocery store, and the woman in front of me was talking to the checkout woman. And they obviously were friends. And she's and the checkout lady said to her, all right, see you later, Pisces. And then the lady walked away, and I looked at her, and she said, yeah, we're both Pisces. And then she started going on about their character traits. And then she looked at me and said, what are you? And I said, I'm a Libra. And she went, oh. And she had this whole list of what she assumed I was, right, just based on that, not even knowing where my moon was or my sun <laughs> or whatever. Yeah. But you know what I'm saying? Yeah. She She just made all these assumptions, and I thought – you know, like everything, you can you can really dig deep into something or you can just decide to put somebody in an archetype or a label based on the day that they were born. There are exceptions to every rule, and I'm sure that there are some Tauruses that aren't aggressive and some Libras that aren't trying to balance out everything. <laughs> well, that's exactly right, because because there's so much complexity. It's we, when, we, uh, when we say a person is a Libra or Taurus, what we're really saying is that's, that's where the sun was when they were born, and mm-hmm. that's important, but... The rising sign, for instance, the sign that's cresting on the eastern horizon, is actually the sign that gives the clue to the soul's deeper intention. Mm-hmm. And and the people don't even realize that that rising sign is, in a certain sense, as important, if not more important, than the birth sign. Mm-hmm. And then the moon sign is very. The moon sign is, you know, people. It's often talked about as the symbol for the emotions and the past and and the instinctual life and rhythms and 
that's all true, but on a deeper level, the moon is the symbol of the prison of the soul. Mm. It can represent instinctual tendencies that can defeat the soul from being more effective. Uh, much of the spiritual path has to do with solving the problem of the moon in your chart. But I just bring this up because there's, you're quite right. You know, There's a kind of simplistic attitude about astrology out there that, oh, a Libra has to be this way, not realizing that that's only one piece of a multifaceted puzzle, mm-hmm. an astrological puzzle of understanding oneself. So all you listeners out there, go get some esoteric astrology done and find out what your rising sign is. Then that'll really start a conversation. Uh, before I let you go, William, I want to ask you, is there an, any sort of belief system that you maybe embraced early in your path that you spoke out about very confidently that now perhaps today, knowing all that you know, you've changed your mind about? Um, I, I wouldn't say changed my mind. I would say um, realize, realize that it was a stepping stone only. Sure. Um, you know, for when, when I started with TM, that was really important to me, and that was centered to my life. Then, then, I, um, then I entered into uh, the next step, which was I entered into this, uh, something called the science of mind, mm. which was a theology that had to do with the notion that you are the product of your thinking. Mm. So, and, and, and that was really important to me for a while, and I suppose at that time I felt like this was it, mm-hmm. only to rec- realize that, oh, that's a stepping stone too, and I discovered something called The Course in Miracles, which mm. you've heard of. Of course. I, 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 I dove into The Course in Miracles, and that was really central to my life and did all of the work with that. And then, and, then, um, and, and so then I realized, oh, that's a stepping stone too. And so um, that's about the same time that I discovered the esoteric philosophy. And uh, so far I haven't found what the next stepping stone is because I'm, um, I'm still learning and growing using the esoteric philosophy as my tool for that. But the day may come. It just mm-hmm. hasn't happened yet. I've also studied Buddhism and mystical Christianity and those sorts of things. And all of them have given me uh, pieces. Let, let's put it this way. Um, In terms of religion, let's use the word religion, one of the fundamental principles, I believe, is this, that no religion has found the truth, but every religion has found a piece of it. Very good. Very good. And we take a lot from column A and column Z, and we make our own stew. And it's okay. That's true. We have to do that. Yes. Oh, what a wonderful way to look at that. Thank you so much, William. I'm excited that you're coming to town. For all of you listeners out there that want to possibly meet William Meter in person, head to Equilibrium on April 17th from 6 to 8 p.m. Equilibrium-e3.com is their website. E, the number three, dot com. It's on South Wabash, I believe. I think 850 if my memory serves, but I'm just throwing that out there. So go on the website to make sure. And uh, William, how would you like the listeners to keep in touch with you? What's your your best way? Well, go go to my website, mm-hmm. and uh, my website is just um, um, meter my mm-hmm. last name m e a d e r dot org. Yep. And um, take a look at it. Uh, there's a lot of valuable information and inf- uh, st- stuff that I think there's useful articles, videos to watch. But also sign up for my my email list, and and uh, then you are kept abreast of. What I'm doing, I have a blog that you would be receiving that uh, uh, supports the teaching of this philosophy, but also it'll let you know when I'm in your neighborhood again and when I'm coming to, to town, so to speak. Very good. Give everybody the early heads up. Meter.org, M-E-A-D-E-R.org. William Meter, thanks so much for being on the program. I'm so grateful. My pleasure. Thank you. Everybody out there, I am at jenweigel.com. You can find me at J-E-N-W-E-I-G-E-L.com. Please treat others the way you'd like to be treated. Share this podcast if it resonated for you at all. And stay spiritual, damn it. Spiritual, damn it. Spiritual, damn it.